John Coyne is the head of the North and Australia Security Program and the Strategic Policing and Law Enforcement Program at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. John, great to see you. Hi, Mike. Great to see you and great to be back here talking with you. The old saying, divide and conquer, seems to be almost the mantra for the CCP. It would also seem to be uh, having some effect. Uh, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative with the Andrews government in Victoria and the nose to nose with the federal government and with New Zealand suggesting that Australia should show respect to China. What's your views on that? Look, Mike, I've got a number of views on this, but I think from the start, um, let, let's talk about the effect of it. And then we'll also talk a little bit about why why China is using this sort of approach. And I want to be very clear to the people watching this, and that is that, um, you know, you can look at these events and see and say, be very sort of pessimistic about them. But let me say this, which is, for instance, the relationship with New Zealand. Okay. New Zealand has shed um, blood and treasure in support of its allies. Um, and whilst, you know, a small wedge may have been driven in between um, New Zealand and Australia recently over trade comments, um, that relationship is strong. Uh, the Federation here in Australia, the Chinese might take it as a great victory that they've got uh, Victoria to sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative. But over the last 12 months, what we've seen um, through things like the National Cabinet is an incredibly strong Australian government. Um, you know, the Federation is in, great, um, is in great straits at the moment. And we can expect in the broader sense that um, even if that agreement is cancelled with the Belt and Road and the Victorian government, that the Federation will go on. Now, to the other side of that sort of that point I was making is this. Um, when you're an assertive nation that is growing bigger and wants more power, um, you want a world where you can engage bilaterally. Um, and in this case, this is exactly what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. It's trying to divide and conquer. It's trying to, um, you know, when it comes to the almost 80 year old agreement between the five eyes countries, so Canada, UK, US, New Zealand and Australia, is trying to drive a wedge in there. Um, it's trying to say things that, you know, that it's a racist organisation, which simply aren't true. Um, and it's trying, and at times been quite successful in creating that, that environment where everything must be done at a bilateral, so a country to country level. And that's something that the Australian government must work on with its um, allies and in the, um, within the, the construct of the global rules-based order to address. China's state media has been very critical of your recent article, pointing out some flaws in China's strategic thinking. Uh, tell us about you know, what they objected to the most in your article and, and why? Um, look, I think that they responded, and it's, it's really quite interesting, um, Mike, you know, they responded within sort of, I guess, less than 24 hours through the Global Times. Now, um, again, for those watching this, the Global Times is a state-owned um, media outlet, so not like the ABC in Australia, um, where it has a degree of independence. Um, it is state-owned and state-operated. Um, secondly, is they took great umbrage in the fact that this was a commentary that their strategies weren't working, um, that their efforts to use wedge politics and identity politics were actually being destructive, um, that their efforts to use aggressive um, trade attacks and on Australia um, were creating a hardened camper and not having the impact that they want. Uh, that those efforts to, to hold Australia to ransom are in fact tarnishing Beijing's reputation. Um, so I think they took great umbrage on that. And um, that's, that's to be understood. I mean, I think it's a sore spot for them because that's where the power that they're looking for is coming from. What's um, China's main beef with Australia? And I suppose beef is one of those things too. <laughs> Well, that's exactly right, and near and dear to my heart, as a Queensland boy originally from Emerald and Central Queensland, whose family are in the cattle industry, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's of course <laughs> right there in the forefront of my family's conversations. But quite separately from that, their beef is this: um, they don't want anyone, as in the Chinese Communist Party. This isn't about China, the people. Uh, it's got nothing to do with that. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't want anyone outspoken against them. Uh, they gave us 14 points that they were angry with us on and we needed to change. Now, we can put all of, you know, not go through all of those lists here today, but some of them, um, you know, 
the fact that Australia had said that it had cancelled 10 activities in foreign investment because it felt that those were impacting on our national sovereignty. So I reverse that question to you and say, well, if we were to want to invest in industries in China uh, that were of sovereign and critical nature to the Chinese government, would they allow us to do so? Um, they felt that uh, by demanding publicly uh, a inquiry into the COVID-19 that we were somehow embarrassing them and that we were following the American uh, rules. Now, I, I think that was a very reasonable thing and people have said we, we want to have a global inquiry uh, that's f open and free, free and uh, fearless and frank about um, where the COVID-19 virus originated from. Mm. So I think they've got a number of these very unrealistic expectations of how Australia ought to behave, um, and it's forcing them. And that's where this, this argument is from. And I think in some ways they fundamentally misunderstand the world and Australian culture, which is, um, you know, what we've seen here in Canberra is a hardening of our response Instead of us saying, well, look, you're attacking us economically and putting bans on our trade, on beef, on um, uh, on our WA um, lobsters, etc., the Australian government's taking a much harsher viewpoint and saying, well, we will find new markets. We must not be reliant here. And I might add, this isn't the first time that um, the Chinese Communist Party has done this. So for people watching this, rare earth elements, okay, these are the small little metals that go into making things like phones and joint strike fighters. Uh, on two occasions, Chinese government own a um, roughly the supply, about 80% of the supply of those rare earth elements in the world. They've constricted supply to the um, markets in Japan in response to some uh, political and diplomatic fallouts. Um, they've locked them out parts of the US market. Now, on both of those occasions, Japan and the US have looked to find um, new ways of obtaining rare earth. So the idea here is is not to respond to this sort of pressure by kowtowing, it's by, by being strong. And in fact, um, I think deep down, the Chinese Communist Party will respect Australia far more from taking a strong position than taking a weak position. Where do you see Australian policies, say, with respect to China, altering maybe in the next few years? Uh, look, uh, you know, I'd like to think that this is a situation where um, eventually the Chinese Communist Party will realise uh, that it needs to be far more responsible and operate within the rules-based order. Uh, it needs to tone back its aggression in places like the South China Sea and that, um, you know, as we've seen recently, orders for coast guards to be able to open fire on people in the South China Sea, etc. I'd like to see those, those stepping back. Unfortunately, I don't think that is going to be the case. I think we face an extended or a protracted period uh, where re the relationship diplomatically and economically will be under pressure. So I think we're going to see more of the same, Mike, for some time to come. Are there regional groupings, um, for example, Quad or strategically important countries where Australia could be doing more? Um, look, I think there are. And, I, I, and I th I'd like to say, I think rare earth elements is a really good one example of that. Um, so we've been blessed in this country by having um, a number of rare earths present here. Um, one of the challenges of mining rare earths is getting significant enough um, equity investment to make these sorts of mines viable. Um, I think there's a real opportunity here, for instance, for the Japanese government, the Australian government and the US government to work collaboratively to to create an alternative and secure supply chain of rare earths and to put more competition into the global market. So I think there's there's definitely room for that. I think there's greater room for cooperation more broadly across the region and bringing closer relationships. Um, multilateralism works and we need to continue to make that work um, and to counterbalance the efforts of a Chinese Communist Party that revels in the idea of um, dividing the world. How do you see, moving across the pond here, uh, and we know that Donald Trump, uh, his mantra was put America first. How do you see Joe Biden and his personal and political links, which are well noted and uh, in, in a lot of the media around the world, his links with China, including those of his political advisors affecting US-China relations, and in turn, what happens in our region? Look, Mike, I 
couple of things with that. I think first off, you know, in today's globalized world, it's very difficult for anyone who's in business, uh, who's in the world of economics, uh, defense and other industries to not have at least some connection to China. Uh, you know, Chinese global supply chains are, are broad, wide and deep. Um, but, you know, I, I think that if we look back, you know, in the Obama years, we saw a, a very clear commitment of a pivot um, to the Indo-Pacific region. I think there's a very reasonable expectation that that will continue. And certainly there's no evidence to suggest at this stage of any sort of abandonment or move away from um, from the Indo-Pacific by the US in any form. So I think we're going to see continued investment in that. And I think we will see, um, while some in Beijing might hope that there'll be a, a you know, a, a defrosting and that there'll be a much more open and easy to deal with uh, Washington, I'm not sure that's the case. Interesting times. Um, and China is certainly beating its chest a fair bit. Do you think this is just mainly uh, bravado on China's part or are they really serious? Because look, they're uh, in, uh, which I heard today, in fact, they're uh, quite entrenched in uh, around in the Caribbean, uh, through Africa, but also on our, on our doorstep around New Guinea uh, with that uh, rather large city they want to build there on the water, which is just a hop, skip and a jump from Darwin. Uh, plus also the other South Pacific nations surrounding Australia. Do you think that we should be a little more wary of China or is this, as I said, is this just the, the beating of the chest before they, uh, before they get back to uh, negotiations and uh, living as much in harmony as possible. Look, I think there's an awakening more broadly, certainly regionally, um, to the challenges of how to deal diplomatically, economically, politically um, with China. Okay, So I think that's the case. Uh, but, you know, you and I are old enough to remember this, and I always put in this sense, so, you know, the... It's not so much, I was going to say the 70s, Mike, but I think that'd be unfair. So let's just say the 80s. The, but, you know, the 60s, 70s and 80s, the world faced an existential threat from um, global thermonuclear war. Mm. Okay, it was a real possibility. At the time, though, there were very clear rules of the road. Um, don't get me wrong, there were times, and I think that if you look back on your own youth, you'll probably remember times where, um, you know, the doomsday clock worried us all. And we thought that, you know, we, we saw movies like The Day After it's, and... Uh, webs in the UK that showed this, you know, global nuclear wars. Um, I don't think that's the case today, but I do say this to you. Um, with the increased strategic uncertainty that we face globally, um, I think that the likelihood of, of, of a negative or some sort of conflict as a result of strategic miscalculation or operational misadventure um, is really much higher. Mm. Um, it's not the end of the world. By that, what I mean is, is I want you to imagine a young 25-year-old fire, US fighter pilot flying at enormous speeds over the South China Sea and a 25-year-old um, Chinese fighter pilot doing the same, um, one coming too close to the other and making um, a misjudgment. Uh, and I could see some pretty bad consequences coming from that. Similarly, um, some as the rules of the global rules-based order continue to be tested and um, to use the vernacular from the Obama era, red lines keep on getting crossed. Uh, there's greater uncertainty. So the possibility that one or more people or countries involved in this could make a decision um, that was strategically unsound seems possible now too. So uh, I think front and centre of all that though is, is, is this need to, for continued multilateralism, continued co communication. Mm. Um, and to making sure that we identify what the red lines are um, and maintaining sovereignty in this country. The, again, the, uh, the beating of the chest from both sides, the West and, uh, and China. Um, should we continue the West to, to push back? And if we do push back with respect, how long before that actually stops? How long should, do you think that we should say enough's enough, you cannot do this, you must stop. And we know, we know that China just won't stop because, you know, they've got this, uh, this mindset, especially from the CCP. So what do you think we should do? Do you think we should try and negotiate and move our way through it? Or do we need to say at some stage, you must stop? Look, I think these things, uh, this is where we're seeing, a, a, I guess, a, a progressive ratcheting up of this. I, I, I want to pick up that use of the word beating the chest. And I certainly, I don't think... Um, I don't think, and you know, look, people like to throw that around. I don't think the West has been beating its chest on these issues. Um, it has been raising 
considerations and alarms. So let's take let's like trade sanctions. Mm. Um, so you know, the Chinese Communist Party um, wants to develop and wants the opportunity to develop economically for its 1.4 billion um, population, and that, that's a very fair thing to want to do. Um, that said, we as Australians and the West want to make sure that we have secure supply chains. So you know, pardon the pardon the silliness of it, but you know, so that we always have toilet paper on the shelves and we have medicines and we have cars, etc. Now, um, China has shown, and that we have secure markets that keep our economy going. Now, China has shown on a number of occasions, or the Chinese Communist Party, um, that they are willing to constrict supply. Mm. And they are willing to cancel orders. They are willing to find ways to stop that two-way t- trade. So um, they're not a reliable trade partner. So one of the ways of addressing this is not militarily, um, but is by finding alternatives to markets uh, to reduce the risk, both in terms of sales and, and in terms of imports and manufacturing. So supply chains more broadly. Um, secondly, though, is, you know, Things like the freedom of navigation exercises that uh, a variety of militaries do through the South China Sea send a very clear message that um, the Chinese Communist Party's claim over the South China Sea remains contested um, and that there is a global right to continue to do freedom of navigation exercises through that region. Um, So, you know, I think that, you know, this isn't about beating chests and um, and war drums. This is about making sure... um, that we put these things in place in the best of our nation's interest. Similarly, um, you know, foreign interference with, by whatever country in Australia is unacceptable. Interesting, um, and, uh, and time for another discussion later on. Uh, words just uh, come through that they think that China has been nicking uh, India's uh, energy, and we have um, uh, all sorts of uh, again the uh, the bravado in the South China Sea. Um, you know, reports saying that um, China, with their lone wolf, uh, doing the same sort of approach with their uh, patrol boats with uh, the the, uh, the Philippines. So a lot of things to uh, talk about there, which is fact and which, which is fiction. Uh, from the media, I probably believe it's more uh, more the, uh, the, the, the world of make-believe, but um, it certainly makes good reading. John Coyne, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. As always, it's been fun.